To create the setup, I found a How To Geek installation guide to Windows 9 to 5. I use this as a reference for the PowerPoint build. Now because this is a PowerPoint presentation, there's obviously no installation on the hard disk, so to speak. Therefore, I included the setup within the OS itself. I styled the buttons using a bevel and created the icons and images out of shapes. I wanted to make sure everything was made in PowerPoint alone. It is important that the feel of the operating system is emulated as well as the look. I studied footage of people using Windows 95 to refresh my memory. Often, advanced PowerPoint OS requires you to plan everything out before you actually make it. However, I created a concept build to get a general idea how it would look and work. Then I created the loading screen, but replaced Microsoft with PowerPoint. Day 2. On this day, I had finished where I left off during the creation of the concepts. Now that was all out of the way, the fun stuff was about to happen. I started working on the programming, and it was really tedious. However, eventually I successfully created a window dragging system by capturing the cursor position using a label control and applying it to the window preview. Next, I had the ability to switch between windows. However, I was to combat the issue of ActiveX controls from inactive windows appearing on top of active windows because they are rendered separately from the slide. Next, I reproduced my test code in the main builds. To enable window resizing, it was best I did not group my windows into one shape, but that led to some pretty complex code. To make sure the position I grabbed the window header stayed relative, I worked out I can get the initial difference between the cursor and the position and subtract it when the mouse is moved. All the windows stayed on the same slide, so I made sure the start menu was no exception. I renamed each part of the menu so I could separate it from the other windows, but unfortunately getting it to stay on top of other windows corrupted the Z order which meant I had to group the start menu after all. It was finally time to solve the ActiveX control problem. Firstly, I created replicas of the controls to take their place while the actual controls were invisible. The only problem I had here was trying to differentiate controls from one another because the OLE control names can only accept alphanumeric characters and not the symbol system I was using for the auto shapes. My original idea was to create temporary text boxes that can fit themselves into the positions of the replicas when the text box is selected. But that meant each application could only have a limited amount of controls. It also meant that I couldn't have code unique to a specific control. Instead, I renamed them by removing the spaces from their names and have the selection code recognize this. Luckily as well, copying text box code from one slide to another rendered them intact. Meanwhile, I created a taskbar system to add window buttons for later on. Here was the start of the transition between the concept build and the final thing. The current build didn't look at all like Windows 95, so I corrected the proportions of everything and populated the start menu with some applications.
Finally, the trickiest part of the whole window system, window resizing. I scratched my head for a while at possible ways of doing this, but eventually I came up with an idea. The name of each element in a window would be appended with a curly bracketed enclosed diagonal compass direction, referring to which part of the window the control was pinned to. For example, if the east side of the window was resized, all the buttons that are pinned with east would move with it. I modified a lot of the icons and buttons to be more closely reminiscent of Windows 95. I added window badges and changed the offset of the text in the window headers by increasing the left margin. Then I added the window resizing ability to the main build, working out how to maintain the right side's position whilst modifying the left was quite a challenge, but eventually I worked it out through trial and error. To make sure that the user couldn't resize a window too small, I fitted each window with a minimum resize that if not met would automatically fit it to the default size. Admittedly, my code was very much like spaghetti, and I'd neglected to add many functions, so there was a lot of reused code and botching together. However, eventually I finally completed it, and although it's slightly buggy, it worked. After this, I played around with the window resizing to check everything was working and in check, and began to turn my attention to the start menu. Originally, I grouped everything so that toggling was easy, but here I realised I had to have sub-menus and separate sub-menus, and display click menus as blue, etc. This meant I had to search the shapes within groups as well as single shapes to highlight blue menus, which would slow down my code a lot. I appended separate code to the start menu toggle code to recognise start menu submenus as separate entities, but all be hidden at the same time when the start menu is closed. I also created a universal macro that would find the submenu specified by the text frame of the selector, open it, and then close any other submenus on the same level. I also added menus for settings and documents, but because I hadn't coded the file system yet, I couldn't add a list of recently opened documents, so instead, the resulting menu would point rather disappointingly to the documents folder. I plan to ship this version with a few extra apps from Orbit to extend its functionality because, well, let's face it, six apps isn't much. With most of the Windows system in place, it was finally time to focus on individual application functionality. I started off by adding a shutdown dialog with radio buttons. I also needed to fix the problem of the last opened window setting itself to the current one whenever the user moves the window, 
because it selects it again after each resize or reposition. I added an if statement to prevent the last to open window being changed if the current one was already selected. Meanwhile, I worked on minimizing, maximizing, and restoring windows. For maximizing, I copied the code from the window resizing and adapted it to fit the whole screen. For restoring, I resized the window back to its minimum size. The next landmark feature was the command prompt. From this, I searched all the MS-DOS commands and created a table of the ones I would use and where possible. Unfortunately, it would be way too much effort to include switches and redirects to the syntax, so I kept it quite basic but recognizable. In a future service pack update, I will refine the command prompt further. I worked on the file system by having each file or folder as a shape, with the name being the file path and the text frame being the value. I could have used tags, but then I'd have to encode images into strings as well, which would have been outside my abilities. Having images stored in shapes as well would be a seamless integration. I could also have used folders, but that would breach the rule of making the OS in a single presentation. In addition, I could use other properties in the shape, such as color or line width, to encode properties such as read-only, missions, etc. At this point, I managed to integrate around 90% of the planned commands into the prompt. The user would be able to create files with a custom data command, change the directory with the CD by moving out the directories using full stops or setting the directory to either a full path or a subfolder, delete as many files as they like at once, copy as many files as they like to a location, display the text using echo, make a directory and display all the folders within the current directory. I also created inbuilt error handling by checking files or folders exist before modifying them and redirecting any VBA errors to display in the command prompt. Finally, I created an open and close macro for the command prompt and got the taskbar to rebuild itself automatically when a window is removed or added. Finally, let's review what has been done so far. First up, a ridiculous amount of code. This isn't necessarily a good thing because it's very messy, and because it's been a learning experience working on this project, it's easy to see the chronology of the code. Secondly, a custom loading screen that hopefully retains a feel of the original, and an inbuilt setup in the style of the original installer that fits a PowerPoint OS format. Number 3. A very modern feature in terms of PowerPoint OS is the ability to move windows. So is the ability to minimize windows and stack them. 
This feature may be original, but I'm not sure, so I won't assume the throne. But window resizing is a very new feature in PowerPoint OS 2. At number 5, it's a working start menu with submenus. Number 6, the command prompt, assimilating some of the MS-DOS syntax whilst deviating enough to be simple and original. A file system with nested folders first appeared in Project Arcturus, though my code is completely separate. And finally, any errors are redirected to the prompt or prevented with checks. And finally, evaluation time and planned features for part 2. Number 1. Remove glitchy window dragging and iron out window resizing bugs. Otherwise, Dong Van Technologies will find plenty of them, and we don't want that. Next, I plan to include a version of Paint, because what is Windows 95 without Paint? Oh, and also sorry for the terrible drawing I just made. Number 3 is Internet Explorer. It'll be tricky finding an auto shape replica for that, but hey, it's a challenge worth rising to. It's not very attractive managing all your files in the command prompt, so I'll be sure to include Windows Explorer and the control panel. And make sure to click subscribe if you enjoyed this, because part 2 will be out in a jiffy, along with the open source download. Until then, I'll feed the same.